I think in every surgeon's career, even though you do tons of surgeries over the course of your surgical career, there are going to be um, these sort of standout patients that you're never going to forget for either good reasons or bad reasons. They're going to always be right at the forefront of your mind. And for me, Madeline is one of those patients. I was first contacted by Sandra, Madeline's daughter, to come in and meet with Dr. Osborne and have him review her case. Um, the way she worded that first talk, it was, my mother has a football-sized tumor. She walked into the consultation room. And initially, I really couldn't see the tumor, to tell you the truth. And she had this really funky do, like her hair was like, it was, I mean, it all honestly it was like a hot mess. My first impression was, what is under that hair? What's happening? Basically it looked like uh, she had been, you know, in hiding or um, like she had been abducted for the last 20 years of her life. You know, she had very artistically uh, draped hair over this tumor and even when she moved her head, it, you still saw nothing. You could tell there was something there because it was uh, pretty large. I didn't realize that under there was literally a second head. And she really looked like she hadn't been out in public in a long time. She looked terrified, actually. She was a little bit apprehensive about even making eye contact with us. And throughout probably 75% of our discussion, I, I, I still had no idea what we were talking about. It probably took her about, you know, maybe half an hour before she would actually expose the tumor so that we could see it. She was saying, I have a difficult case and I'm not sure if I want to do surgery. She didn't have any scans with her, so I, I still didn't know anything. So I'm thinking, is this really that difficult of a case? And I'll be honest with you, when I saw that tumor for the first time, my eyes were wide open. It was probably the biggest product tumor I'd ever seen in my life. I don't think my mouth dropped or anything, but and I don't think my eyes got big. I think I held it together, but I, I definitely was like, well, what, what, what the heck is going on right there? Right? Like I was shocked. It was huge. I was not sure if this patient wanted to do the surgery, and I wasn't sure that we wanted to participate in our surgery at all. At that point, I understood what was going on. This lady was trapped. I mean, somehow, some way she had existed and allowed this thing to grow to a point where literally the tumor was probably bigger than her own actual head. And at that point, all I could think about was, oh my gosh, I mean, what are we gonna do with this lady? My name is Ryan Osborne. I train as a head and neck surgeon in South Central Los Angeles, managing the most complex cancer and trauma patients in the country. I've operated across the globe in first and third world countries. My experiences have taught me the value of flexible and innovative thinking, but I realized that our healthcare system doesn't always allow for that. So I started Osborne Head and Neck Institute. I made it my mission to find the best, most creative surgeons around, and I gave them the space to excel. Together, we create a new standard of medicine. These are our surgeons. My name is Madeline Garcia, AKA Lynn. Okay, I live in New Jersey, a little town called Pagoda, and I've been living here 33 years. Well, I was a jack of all trade and master at none. You name it, I've done it. And it had children in between all this. I was at a barbecue and I just reached up and I touched behind my ear and I felt this small, some kind, but it didn't feel right to me. It kind of frightened me. I was living in sort of a limbo, putting on a smile. I was always putting on a show. Inside I was aching and pining for what once was, and I knew as time passed that I may never see that again. 10 years later, it doubled in size. 
it was getting where even family parties were just, it, they're not a good time for her. She spent the whole time doing dishes in the kitchen because she just didn't want to be around people. And when you can't enjoy your family, your life is over. So I found Osborne Head and Neck online and I made the appointment. I said, she's going if I have to drag her there kicking and screaming. And I called her and told her. She hung up on me. <laughs> I said, I'm coming back on Monday. The appointment's on Tuesday. And I already left a deposit. I think I told her it was like a thousand dollars or something and I paid for it and it's non-refundable I lied through my teeth there was no deposit there was nothing and she goes well now I have to go don't I <laughs> <laughs> so she went I've seen tons of parotid tumors I've seen them all over the, the country all over the world and Madeline's was unusual it was it was not normal when people say I have a big tumor they mean like seven eight centimeters they mean something the size of like you know, a grapefruit, that, that's big. Um, they're not talking about, you know, a cantaloupe or, uh, or a small melon of some sort. I mean, Madeline's was straight out of a, it's straight out of a book. I mean, it's a, it's a picture. Someone takes it and they, they show you this, this, this picture and say, look at this is how bad it can get, but you know you're never actually gonna see that unless you're watching a, a movie or a documentary or something like that. And here it is, living and breathing. It's like right there, it's like you saw a unicorn or something, I mean not something you ever expect to see, not something I had seen. So it was definitely um, a career moment for me. At the end of the meeting, I was pretty sure we'd never see her again. I was absolutely sure of it, and I was probably gonna be okay with that. I didn't put out an ad in the paper saying, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna see the, the biggest, baddest tumors in the world. No, I didn't. But one is definitely sitting right here in front of me, so I have to make a decision, um, and the decision to me was already made. Uh, this is this is probably going to be my career. This is probably going to be what I'm going to be doing in life. Um, is dealing with situations that people don't want to deal with. We felt that her case was so dire, and no one was going to help her. I needed them a lot more than they needed me, and I knew it. I knew it. So all the doubt just went away. At that point in time, we had seen very large tumors and had been successful at removing them without paralysis. So there was no real need to show any more talent or skill. Like he had proven himself that he could remove those tumors successfully. Um, so you would have to ask him what made him decide to take it. You have to always ask yourself, what is your purpose? Like, why are you? Why do you exist? I think everyone's trying to figure that out. Why am I on this planet? What am I here to do? I'm here to do this. I'm here to try to be there in the situation where somebody needs you and there doesn't seem to be anybody willing to stand up. That, that is my purpose. The day of surgery, we, we blocked out the whole day. We normally block maybe three hours, four hours. We do other cases the same day. Um, but for that day, everything was down. I woke up that morning um, pretty sure that there was only a 50-50 chance that we'd be doing the surgery that day. So I was really relaxed, actually. Um, and then when they said, hey, she actually showed up, I was like, wow, we're really going to do this. OK. Wow, she has actually taken that first step. I think ultimately what brought her to make that decision to move forward, it was the love for her daughter and the trust that she had in Dr. Osborne that she wasn't able to have with other surgeons. I think that combination, even Sandra being on board with Dr. Osborne, um, all that probably added and, and made it happen for her. The picture taking in the office I was with my fiance, and he had never seen the tumor in its entirety from every angle, and he was blown away, And I, as was I. It didn't look like a tumor, it almost looked like it was a second head. It was extending all the way down below her jawline into her neck. It had blood vessels running over the top of it that were the size of your jugular vein. 
I wasn't worried. Somehow I just knew that everything was going to be fine. Dr. Osborne and Dr. Hamilton had instilled in me this sense of, this is routine. It wasn't routine. I knew that. And they knew it. game time and I remember thinking okay I've got my whole team locked into this surgery I've dragged them into this I got to step up to the plate here you know for sure there, there's no two ways about this I don't even remember exactly how long that surgery was I know people had to take breaks uh, the bathroom so I, it probably was long but in my head um, I have no concept of time I just know that it, it was a uh, it was an intense day that day all we could think of all day was Dr. Osborne and Dr. Hamilton are in this case and where are they and how far are they getting right now and it's this time are they almost done how, how is she doing? You know, everybody was very alert to see, like, where, where are we in this surgery? And we knew that it was a defining point for Dr. Osborne. We wanted, we wanted a successful surgery. We all wanted that for her, for him. It was a, a huge day. When the tumor came out, it was like a baby was born. People were very happy. Everyone was excited because, you know, we had, we had achieved it. The tumor was out. It was, uh, you know, biggest tumor that I'd ever, you know, had the opportunity or the pleasure to remove from the patient. When we take a tumor out, we put it in a uh, specimen cup that goes to pathology. This was not gonna fit in a cup. So we had to get a specimen bucket. And then we quickly went to work on closing her up and reconstructing her face so that we could get her back to as normal as possible at the end of the case. And when we were done, she looked really, really good. All we have to see now when she wake up is, is her face gonna move? So for me, the surgery wasn't over at that point. I was waiting for her to completely wake up and I needed to see if she was gonna move her face. When she woke up, her face moved and it was a miracle, it was fantastic. I really cared about her. I wanted to see her smile and see how she was after surgery. and. <laughs> She was great, you know, she had her wrap around her head and she smiled and I was like, I almost cried because it's like you see her smile and you see that all her fears are gone, this is behind her, she just like recovered years of her life and that, that was very rewarding, like aside from anything that it could have meant for our, the practice and for the doctor and everything, there's such a human component to it, you know, that just makes you feel like you helped out, you know, you, you made a difference, you helped this person move forward and move on with their lives. There's no denying that our actions of the past affect the landscape of our future. The decision to help Madeline five years ago put us in a position where we have become an international referral source for others just like Madeline. This tiny lady from a small town in New Jersey became the gateway for us to have the honor of helping patients around the world. I recently accepted a gracious invitation to Madeline's home for breakfast, a unique opportunity to tie together the past with the present.
Our intentions, they do matter, but they don't save us from judgment. Only our results do. When I met Madeline, I was forced to accept this. With the complexity of her case and her age, the possibility of her life ending on the operating table, it had to be taken into consideration. If that would have occurred, my entire team would have been scrutinized. However, I felt her life had already ended decades ago. The tumor had caused her to become withdrawn and reclusive. We were simply trying to resuscitate her life and bring her back. There's something unique about being a doctor. No other profession can truly capture it. I think it's the human element of a patient giving their life over to another. People like Madeline, they look at me like I'm more than a man. The confidence and the safety they feel with me, it's a privilege, but it weighs heavy sometimes because I actually know I am just a man. So I pray, in those moments I pray for guidance, for direction, and for courage. It is just surreal, and it, it was almost like a nightmare that you woke up from, and you can, can't believe that you lived that way for so long. And it was just unbelievable. I felt like my self-esteem, it just took a major hit. Oh, it, there were so many instances that you know, you just want to crawl into a hole. If I were, were having company, I would go into the bathroom and I would need that bathroom for three hours. So two and a half to three hours where I would wash my hair, blow it dry, set it, and then comb it out and carefully comb it down and underneath the tumor. And then I would even glue it. A woman actually stopped her car to have a good look at me, you know. And I had to say to her, didn't your parents ever teach you not to stare? And she very nervously scattered off. Strangers come in and they want to know what's this all about. I was not going to start up a conversation with somebody that was curious as to what was underneath that clump of hair. And of course I don't blame them, but I don't want to spend my time there, you know. I got out of the house talking about, you know, what I'm doing about this because nobody's going to like the answer that I'm giving. I'm doing nothing. It was a very difficult time because when Sandra was, from the time she was nine until she was 12, she was dancing for New York City Ballet in children's productions, The Nutcracker and others, and I had to be there. People were curious. They knew that there was something under this hair. It was starting to grow. And some people were downright rude, and some people were just so sweet about it. This was constant until it just got to the point where I just had to have some peace and stay at home. I stopped with the doctors. I just couldn't hear it anymore because they were, some of them were downright um, cruel in some of the things that they said, and um, I couldn't deal with it. I may not have liked the course that my life was taking because of this decision, but I, I would never have said, okay, I've had enough. I felt so strong that somehow, some way, Someday, something has to give here. But then, uh, probably the last 10 years that I spent in this house, um, I was giving up that hope. What has changed since I had the surgery? I got my life back. 
I was living in sort of a limbo. Inside I was just, I don't know, it was very, very, very difficult. I was always putting on a show. And I find that I don't have to do that anymore. I can walk out my front door, which I never did. I walked out the back door. The rest is history, as you know. She came to the office for a follow-up sometime later, like I think it may have been over a year. She's a completely different woman. She is dressed, you know, to the nines. Her hair was done. She came with her daughter. They've been traveling all over the world. She was living the life that she missed for all those decades that she was kind of locked away in her home. And that was actually the most rewarding part. Not doing the surgery successfully, but successfully giving somebody back their life that they had lost because of this tumor. And uh, that was really excited to see. And um, that was the most rewarding part for me. I think you still kind of wake up every day. Mm -hmm. I do. Thanking your... Mm -hmm. You call them your, guard your guardian angels? Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Osborne, of course. Yeah, they are my guardian angels. They made me who I am today. And we thank them every day for changing our lives and our family's lives. Now, since that time, we've had several cases that are comparable to Madeline's. And I think our experience with her um, and the confidence that we had from that case. And even, you know, having her speak to other patients that were potentially in her similar situation, I think has just been um, very helpful for the practice and has allowed us to um, grow and help more people in her situation. This case really touch him at a personal level. You know, he's the kind of person I feel that takes on challenges, like he doesn't, go the easy route even when he's got it, you know, so, and he's always talked about himself being that way. So I think these large tumors that kept coming his way kind of put that to test. Like, do you really mean that you want those challenges? Like, here you go. And so, and he took them, he took one, he took the other one, he took one that wasn't benign. When you ask, like, was it a game changer? It was, it was a test to his personality, I feel like. and. Is he true to what he tells us and what he feels and what he says he's all about? You know, he's about excellence and giving patients his all. And I felt like when those cases were coming and they still come these days, it kind of reinforces that. Every time that he takes them, it's like, yep, this is what I'm here to do. Like, don't give me the easy ones. And, you know, it's a, it's a blessing and a burden. <laughs> because it's at a risk. There's like nothing else to prove, and yet he's still taking the cases, you know? So people always still call and they ask me, um, are you still 100% success rate? And uh, what do you mean by that? And they're asking me, have you had any, any facial paralysis cases? We saw that big one that you did. And they're talking about Madeline. And I always say, yeah, we're still 100% success rate. We have had no complications thus far, but that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about success, I realize uh, Madeline clarified what success is for me. That's the way life is. Do you think people that. came because of her photos? Because oh, yeah. of seeing? It gave a lot of people the courage to come out and take a chance. Mm -hmm. And so since then, it just kind of kept coming and, and still we're 100%. Is what it is, you know, and and I wasn't looking for that to occur. You know, you understand, like when I met you, I had no desire to be taking on tumors like that. That there was not like when I had my master plan was not to do that. Mm -hmm. And then that's what happens in life. Your plan gets changed. You changed my career. I changed your career. You changed my career. Successes for me is I have delivered the result to the patient that they had desired and I have not let my team down. And I think I'm still at 100% success on those measures. And those are the only measures that really matter.